Combating the Knights of Columbus Using the Sword of the Spirit to Reprove the Knights of Columbus By Scroll Independent Ministries Second Corinthians 10 verses 4 to 5 For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So, what is the intention for this presentation? To provide initial descriptions for the Catholic fraternity known as the Knights of Columbus to show the hidden workings and secret ceremonies once, and possibly still, practiced by the knights, to show the dark and twisted nature of Catholicism and the Jesuits, showing the unbiblical and even antichrist nature of the Roman Catholic system, comparing the practices of the KFC to other fraternities, and using the light of God's word to reprove the darkness of the principalities and powers of this world. So, right off the bat, what are the Knights of Columbus? The Knights of Columbus, KFC, is a global Catholic fraternal service order founded by F.R. Michael J. McGivney, called Father, but we're not supposed to call any man Father, on March 29. 1882. Membership is limited to practicing Catholic men. It is led by Patrick E. Kelly, the Order's 14th Supreme Knight. The organization is named after the Italian explorer Christopher Columbus. The organization was founded in March 1882 as a mutual benefit society for working class and immigrant Catholics in the United States in addition to providing an insurance system for its members, its charter states that it endeavors to promote such social and intellectual intercourse among its members as shall be desirable and proper. It has grown to support refugee relief, Catholic education, local parishes and dioceses, and global Catholic social and political causes. The Knights promote the Catholic view on public policy issues, including opposition to same-sex marriage and abortion. So, yeah, it looks like uh, the Catholics uh, or the Knights of Columbus do have a bit of sway. Um, there is a, a level of influence uh, that they do have. Um, let's continue. And here's, here's a quotation uh, from uh, Romanism, A Menace to the Nation, by uh, Jeremiah Crowley, uh, 1912. It says, The knights themselves, it may be truthfully said, are not in the organization entirely for the sake of their own health, or even for the glory of the church, inasmuch as there are many ambitious men among their leaders, and some have little or no use for the church. However, they work in collusion with the hierarchy, and are heart and soul in politics. This fact is well known to political machines and non-Catholic politicians, whose candidates must receive the approval of Rome and the Knights before they dare nominate them for either dog pound or presidency. Right? So, um... Hmm, that sounds pretty intimidating. I wonder if there's any uh, merit behind that kind of claim. Uh, and as we continue, uh, we'll even see some evidence of that. Okay, so this first article at the top is um, from actually America, a uh, Jesuit review. And uh, the article's name was uh, Knights of Columbus Unveils New Initiation Ceremony That Will Be Public. All right, so let's continue. So, since its founding in 1882, the initiation ceremonies for the first three degrees of the Knights membership, focused on the principles of charity, unity, and fraternity, have been separate and open to members only. The fourth degree, dedicated to the principle of patriotism, was added later and this initiation was also is secret and for members only. 
But starting this year, the Knights have adopted a new ceremony, called the Exemplification of Charity, Unity, and Fraternity. It combines the initiation for the first three degrees into a single ceremony that will be open to family, friends, and fellow par parishioners. Okay, so pause right there. Um, first off, there's a fourth degree. The first three degrees are now considered, oh, it's like, you know, they're going to combine it all into one initiation. Right. Um, we're going to see how that's not entirely true. But that fourth degree, um, that's still secret. That's not public. And uh, if there's one thing that one person could say about the Jesuits is that uh, you shouldn't be trusting the Jesuits. Um, their, their whole point is to infiltrate and, uh, subvert Protestants. It's a counter-reformation movement. Um, at some point, uh, during this presentation, we will be looking at the extreme oath of induction, uh, by the Jesuits. And, uh, no, Je Jesuits are, are not to be trusted. Uh, take that in consideration. Um, so here's uh, the next uh, article here. Um, it's actually from the Protocol Handbook uh, for the Knights of Columbus. And uh, this is what it says. Guests should be sent proper invitations in writing well in advance. Invitations should be mailed at least six weeks before an event. Hmm, six weeks before an event. That's a lot of time. I mean, you could get away with a lot of things in six weeks, you know? All you have to do is just not invite people the weeks that you want to do something secret, right? So, this will afford ample time to respond to the invitation. All invitations should be sent in the name of and signed by the Grand Knight or Faithful Navigator, although he may request that replies be directed to a chairman or committee member. Right? So, uh, yeah. Um, it has to be approved by, uh, by the Grand Knight or Faithful Navigator. Right? So, he can just decide. I don't want him here. I'm not inviting that person. And, uh, yeah, that's how it works. Um, so, so this whole thing of, oh, it's like, you know, a public ceremony. Well, that's great and all, but six weeks in advance, they could do a couple of things, you know, where people don't need to know about it. As a matter of fact, secrets are still considered a part of the oaths. Um, let's read the rest of this paragraph, um, and then I'll just say what we're going to do next. The district deputy, as the special representative of the Supreme Knight and the state deputy, should be invited to special council or assembly functions. It should be understood that his schedule may not permit him to attend every affair, in which case he would respond in ample time. Never give a blanket invitation to anyone. Always send each guest a personal invitation if tickets are being used for a function. Okay. So, here's the issue. Is that it's like, never give a blanket invitation to anyone. So, it's not really open to the public. It's still somewhat of a private venue. Um, they're not going to just let anybody go in there. Right? Unless, of course, maybe it is a public event. Right? It's not a part of their ceremonies. It's not a part of their... So, um, you know, they can get invited six weeks, maybe. Um, but here I want to just, before we get started, before we get, go any further, I'm going to show you a clip um, which claims to be the, the second and third uh, oath um, pledge that a Knight of, Knight of Columbus is to make. Um, so here I'm going to show you the clip. And this guy, just watch this guy. Um, it's very, very sleazy. Uh, very kind of like, I don't know how to feel about him, but he is a knight of Columbus. So, yeah, take that what you will. And so I thought, okay, uh, for those people who maybe think they're 
in the dark, these are not going to um, make your mouth drop or anything like that. You're actually going to be happy that I shared some of this stuff with you. Okay. So, um, you know, they're all here, they're all online, you know, all this stuff. So, um, easy to print up. Okay. So, second degree pledge. Here we go. Drum roll, please. I promise upon my honor as a Catholic gentleman that I will obey the laws and rules and ceremonials of this order dun, 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 and will so conduct my life as to not bring scandal on the church or the order. I promise, I further promise that I will ever abide in unity with the officers and the members of this order and of my council. I further promise by this cross loyalty and obedience to the Catholic Church, to our Supreme Pontiff, our bishops and priests. These promises I regard as binding upon me in conscience until death. There you go. That ain't so bad, eh? No, come on. I love this. I'm pledging loyalty and obedience to the Catholic Church, to the Pope, the bishops, the priests. Wow, oh, that's a good promise to make. I love that one. Okay, is that so bad? So scary? Um, again, I'm not going to give you the secret of the ceremonial, but <laughs> the pledges, the promise. Again, we all should be doing this stuff. This is great. Okay, third degree pledge. Here we go. Hands up. I solemnly promise upon my honor as a Catholic gentleman that I hereby renew and will faithfully keep all the pledges taken by me in the first and second degrees of this order, especially the pledge of secrecy in regards to the ceremonials of this order. It, bring, it being understood that no promises taken by me shall conflict with my religious or civil duties. I further promise ever to observe in all relations with my brother knights, the rules of true fraternity aiding and assisting them at all times, if, it be, if they be worthy. I further promise never to bring partisan politics into this order in any manner whatsoever. These promises I regard as binding upon me in conscience until death. Okay, <laughs> not so bad, is it? Um... Matthew 5, verse 33 to 37. Again, ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old time. Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay. For whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. Hmm. Oh, it's not so bad. Hey, what's going on here? It's like, ah, you know, just swear loyalty to the Catholic Church. I'm sorry. Uh, obviously he's never read this passage and I doubt even the Bible. Um, no, uh, this is wrong. This is wicked. This is awful. I, I have a problem with this. And, uh, if anybody was an actual Bible believer in the Catholic Church, uh, I would imagine that they would also have a problem with it. Okay. Um, yeah, so we're, we're going to be talking about this. We're going to be talking about the, the Knights of Columbus and their oaths and the oaths that, uh, the Catholic Church, um, makes through other fraternities as well. Um, this is going to be a, an exhaustive expose on this whole system. So, uh, hang tight. So in 2020, they claimed to not be a secret organization anymore. But with those who have been working in secret and not being honest for so long in the past, along with parameters that would allow them to still be secretive, why should a person trust them still? In the next following slides, we will be discussing some of the initiations of the KFC 
and some other interesting facts about them. At the end of this presentation, we will end with some closing words, okay? In which we're also going to be looking at other examples of uh, of the, the Knights of Columbus um, and some of the weird uh, and interesting connections one can make uh, with them. Um, let's continue. So here's a Bible passage. It says uh, in Mark 4, verse 22, for there is nothing hid which shall not be manifested, neither was anything kept secret, but that it should come abroad. Okay, so this is called Knights of Columbus Illustrated, a complete ritual and history of the first three degrees, including all secret work, by a former member of the order. All right, so here on the left, you got a picture of. L Pope Leo the Thirteenth. Um, that's a pretty interesting pose, actually. Um, kind of interesting um, where that's coming from. Um, hmm. You almost wonder. Oh, this is where it's where it's uh, from. Uh, well, you can see uh, everybody from Baphomet to George Washington. A very muscular George Washington, um, Madonna, Jack Nicholson, and uh, yeah, even a, even a tarot card uh, doing this pose. Uh, and there you have a statue of, I guess, what is supposed to be Jesus. I mean, mind you, I think the Antichrist is probably going to look a lot like that. But uh, this actually comes from a... Um, an occult history. Um, this is known as As Above, So Below. This is uh, an excerpt from uh, Wikipedia. It says, As Above, So Below is a popular modern paraphrase of the second verse of the Emerald Tablet, a compact and cryptic hermetic text first attested in Arabic, in Arabic source, dating to the late 8th or early 9th century. As it appears in its most widely divulged medieval Latin translation, um, there is a quote there on the Wikipedia page that you can go to. I didn't include it there, but you know, is what it is. Uh, following its use by prominent modern occultists such as Helena P. Blavatsky, uh, 1831 to 1891, uh, co-founder of the Theosophical Society and anonymous with author of the Kabbalion, often taken to William W. Atkinson, 1862-1932, a pioneer of the, th of the New Thought movement. The paraphrase started to take on a life of its own, becoming an often cited motto in New Age circles, right? And, you know, the claim is, is that it was from an emerald tablet of uh, Toth, in uh, ancient Egypt, um, stating that, you know, what happens in, you know, the spiritual dimension is essentially, uh, you know, reverberated and felt through the physical dimension. But there you go. And, and there's your Pope uh, doing the exact same pose. There's a lot of, a lot of weird stuff when, when you point it out. But uh, let's continue. So, in these sections, I'm only going to be just reading uh, the green highlighted text, so uh, to hopefully move uh, through this a little bit faster. Um, so, it has been the rapid growth of the fraternity which has prevented the publishers from presenting the, pu uh, the public with a complete ritual heretofore, as the ritual has been changed several times, and not until the order had adopted something like a permanent work did the publishers feel warranted in issuing this publication. Okay, but let's read the next uh, paragraph. It says, we feel great confidence in now placing this ritual before the public as complete with signs, passwords, and grips, giving in detail a full history and general sketch of the progress of the society. All right. So this is relatively updated. I mean, you know, one can consider. Uh, and at least at some point in the past, this was standard practice, 
great. Um, and 100 years ago? It's not as long as you might think. So, being a religious, as well as a secret order, its secret workings, emphasis on secret, have aroused unusual interest, and, public, and publishers feel that they have satisfied a general demand in presenting this volume with the full first three degrees. So this is going to represent an accurate representation of the first three degrees of the Knights of Columbus. Okay. Knights of Columbus, a historical sketch. The Knights of Columbus is a Roman Catholic organization whose members is confined to men affiliated with the church. Right? This should be pretty clear at this point. Okay? So let's say you know somebody who's been hanging around people from the Knights of uh, Columbus, being a part of the Knights of Columbus. They're Roman Catholic. If they're still hanging out with them and they say that they're a Protestant, uh, well, that that really should be a cause for concern. Um... This is, this is something where it's like people lie about this stuff uh, for their own nefarious means. Um, and uh, let's, let's continue. So, as defined by the Charter, the purposes of the society are to furnish insurance to its members and at least temporary financial aid to the families of deceased members to develop practical Catholicity among its members, to promote Catholic education and charity, right? So the obvious en emphasis is Catholic, right? The mysteries of an oath-bound secret organization meeting behind guarded doors, admission to which can be gained only by whispered words, a friendly grip of the hand that carries with it the thrill and remembrance of common experiences, and at the same time adds a feeling of ease and security even among strangers. These have been alluring to men in all times, but have never been favorably received by Catholics the catholic church clergy uh yeah right um we're gonna prove that that's false as we continue to combat the influence of such societies outside the pale of the church the idea was involved of supplying to the men a society combining all the elements of a secret order and at the same time keeping its movements under surveillance of the catholic clergy as it may be witnessed by the following conditions of membership. Um, right below you have some of the, uh, yeah, the, the conditions. It says all apostolic delegates, cardinals, archbishops, and bishops are ex officio members of the order entitled to admittance on all occasions. All priests, secular and regular, may join the order without examination, but must pay their dues to remain in good standing. Uh, so, why is it that everybody who seems to be on top, you know, all these head guys, they can just show up whenever? Is this the only, maybe, fraternity that they can do that? I don't know. It's an interesting point. Uh, but... Um, here, I'm showing you what the Catholic Church is behind a lot of. Um, okay, so the Catholic Church decides to make our fraternity to, uh, combat people from entering into other fraternities? Uh, that's like, oh, I'm going to start a fire so that I can stop a fire. No, you're just making more fires. So, and as you can see there, uh, the Jesuits, right at the top. Um, if you know a thing or two about the Jesuits, it's like they've obviously got a very controversial history. Um, it, they are a counter-reformation movement. And uh, at some point during this presentation, we're going to be looking at the extreme oath of induction by them, uh, which basically shows it's like by hook or by crook. Um they want to bring everybody under control of the Vatican. Once again, like the Dark Ages. 
Um, yeah, and there was a reason why it was called the Dark Ages. Um, so the Catholic Church is the biggest financial power, wealth accumulator, and property owner in existence. She is a greater pro uh, possessor of material riches than any other single institution, corporation, bank, giant trust, government, or state of the whole globe. The Pope, as the visible ruler of this immense amassment of wealth, is consequently the richest individual in the 20th century. No one can realistically assess how much he is worth in terms of billions of dollars. Right? It was from an article, uh, Vatican Billions, by Avro Manhattan. Yeah. All right, let's continue. All male members of Catholic of the Catholic Church who are over 16 years of age and in good standing are eligible. They must, however, show that they are Catholics, have made their Easter duty, their last Easter duty, are willing and will pledge themselves to live up to the laws of the church. Applications for membership may be made by candidates fulfilling these requirements and their petitions balloted upon at any regular meeting of a council. If elected, the candidates may be initiated and admitted to full membership in the order. Right? Um, so they not they don't only need to be you know Catholics by like let's say you know baptism or whatever as a baby, uh, but they have to be at least somewhat regular attendees, right? Uh, you know that's that's a pretty interesting thing to consider. Um, the committees of the Knights of Columbus do not differ from those of other secret societies, odd numbers being the rule. Right? Hmm. Well, it's uh, Knights of Columbus do not differ from those of other secret, secret societies. Maybe that's because it's another secret society. Okay. At the present time, the Order has subordinate councils firmly established in every state in the United States, in every province in the Dominion of Canada, in Cuba, Puerto Rico, Newfoundland, the Philippine Islands, and Alaska. So they have a pretty big influence. They're pretty much everywhere. Um, and, you know, it's like maybe they do their little uh, whatever food bank. They, uh, they make their spaghetti dinners, you know, but they seem to have some sort of political influence. One might have to ask, you know, how much influence, um, you know, and, and maybe, uh, maybe the Catholic Church has other influential fraternities, um, that this is just kind of like under its umbrella. Maybe this is just one of the daughters of, uh, the mother to use uh, biblical terminology. Columbus Day, the observation of which has been legalized by the legislatures of 15 states, is due mainly to the influence of the Knights of Columbus. Hmm, that's, uh, that's enough influence. These states are California, Colorado, Connecticut, Illinois, Kentucky, Maryland, Massachusetts, Michigan, Missouri, Montana, New Jersey, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Rhode Island. Right? So they have some sort of push. I mean, being national in character, the society has been largely instrumental in secure, securing by the United States government the splendid monument in Washington erected to the memory of Columbus. As he gave to the world a new continent, it is but meet that the knights should endeavor to bring that continent under the influence of religion, goodwill to men, and loyalty to the nation. Uh, which religion, you might ask? Um, and no, uh, it's not uh, Protestantism. <laughs> right? Let's let's just uh, let's let's get that through our heads, guys. If you know anybody who's involved in the Knights of Columbus, um, and they're just hanging out with them, 
you know, and going to their venues and, uh, you know, speaking on behalf of them, they're not going to get a platform unless they're involved. Okay. They're not going to get a platform if their, uh, their allegiance is questionable. Okay. If they have a platform, uh, yeah, they're a part of it. Okay. So a fourth degree was added to the work of the Knights of Columbus on February 22nd, 1900, right? That, that fourth degree that we don't really know too much about, which is a secret. These came from every section of the United States. The requirement for membership in this degree is that a candidate has been a member of the third degree for a period of two years just passed, right? So maybe it doesn't take that long to go through the first three degrees, and maybe a person could be more more loyal to the Knights than first let on, but it takes about two years from third to fourth. Chapter 1. Title of Officers and Order of Seniority of Knights of Columbus, right? So right here, you've got a, li a list of the different uh, positions of uh, the Knights of Columbus. Um, obviously, you have the Grand Knight, you have the cha Chaplain, um, past Grand Knight, um, yeah, and just all these different uh, things in order. Um, so it says, Officers are elected by secret ballot holding office for one year, with the exception of the chaplain and outer inner guards. The chaplain is usually the parish priest. The outer and inner guards are appointed by the Grand Knight. Okay, that was it for uh, chapter one. Um, here we see uh, in chapter two, the instruction. Um, you have here in secret work... The secret work should be practiced as often as circumstances will permit. I'm just going to pause right there for a moment. Well, maybe circumstances will permit it, you know, when there's no visitors around, right? Like now, it's like, okay, they are allowed to have visitors coming in to see the uh, ceremonies, but they also have to have six weeks in advance before they can actually let people in, right? And it has to be approved by the Grand Knight. So the secret work should be practiced as often as circumstances will permit. Maybe it doesn't work this week. Maybe next week. Who knows? That just comes to show you shouldn't be keeping secrets. Um, it starts to make you look bad. Okay. So it will give your officers confidence in themselves and teach your members the mode and use of the secret signs and words. Which, you know, even then, it's like the secret of the ceremonial. It's like, uh, that's all still a part of the Knights of Columbus. Okay. According to ritualistic laws, the forms and language of the ritualist ritual are law, and in innovations or departures from them are positive and direct volition of the order. So um, under superiors, it says, in true accordance with military and fraternal usage, superiors are to be looked up at to as guides and to be obeyed in all things pertaining to the discipline and welfare of the order, right? So, you know, you obviously have a hierarchy and you got people that it's like, oh, you're supposed to look up to them, you know, better to listen to them. They know what they're talking about, Right. But here at the bottom, you actually have a papal tiara. And I thought I would use this opportunity to uh, explain how does the, the Catholic Church view the Pope. But even on this channel, we've actually gone over um, some of the things concerning the Pope. Um, the Catholic Church uh, believes that Peter was their first Pope. Um, they'll typically re uh, refer to uh, Matthew chapter 16. In that passage, um, when Jesus had asked, it's like, who do you say that I am? Peter said, you know, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Where Jesus said, it's like, uh, what was it? You've, you've spoken, um, is my father uh, in heaven that shows you these things. You know, and I said, say to you, 
thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Right? And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth uh, shall be uh, bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose, thou shalt be loose in heaven. Right? So, what is he referring to? He's referring to what Peter said. What he was referring to was what Peter was saying. But in that same chapter, Peter says, it's like, oh, Jesus, you know, don't uh, be uh, crucified. Don't uh, die according to what the scriptures say and what prophecies say. And what did Jesus do? Well, he called Peter Satan, right? Now, is Peter the rock or is he Satan? Well, he's neither. Um, Peter had failures. He had flaws. But he's not uh, considered uh, any greater than a man like Paul was, you know, or uh, a man like John, um, the disciple, was. Um, there's also the fact that in uh, Matthew chapter 18, when he's talking about the church, he says the exact same thing that he said to Peter. It's like, whatsoever uh, thou shalt bind on earth uh, shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose shall be uh, on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Right, so this didn't strictly and solely apply to Peter. Um, this is something uh, that applies to the church. the The claims that the Catholic Church uses to his, their sole uh, power, um, their sole claim to being the only real church that God, uh, Christ established, is not something uh, anywhere found in Scripture. And uh, as we continue. Uh, looking at who the Pope is, uh, there's there's actually seems to be stronger claims otherwise. Um, here, let's read a little bit of uh, what it says about the Pope. Um, this is from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, this uh, first paragraph here. It says, The Pope, Bishop of Rome, and Peter's successor is the perpetual invisible source and foundation of the unity both of the bishops and of the whole company of the faithful. For the Roman pontiff, by reason of his office as vicar of Christ and as pastor of the entire church, uh, has full supreme and universal power over the whole church, a power which he can always exercise but unhindered. The college or body of bishops has no authority unless united with the Roman pontiff, Peter's successor, as his as its head. As such, it this college has supreme and full authority over the universal church, but this power cannot be exercised without the agreement of the Roman pontiff. Right? So you can obviously see that the Pope is considered very, very uh important and influential in the decisions of the Catholic Church, right? He's even called the Vicar of Christ. But what does Vicar of Christ mean? That means in place of Christ. That's what that means. And as we continue further, we're going to see it's like, okay, well, who wants to be in place of Christ, according to the Bible? Um, <clears throat> In turning to Catholic answers on the Vicar of Christ, which is the second paragraph, it says, Vic Vicar of Christ, lat vicarious Christi, right? You know, when somebody is being vicarious, it's like they're in the place of, right? They're doing the things vicariously. They're, they're doing things, you know, kind of like uh, imitating, right? So, a title of the Pope implying his supreme and universal primacy, both of honor and of jurisdiction, over the Church of Christ. Thus, Innocent III appeals for his power to remove bishops to the fact that he is the vic vicar of Christ. Uh, inter corporea uh, de trans, whatever. Uh, he also declares that Christ has given such power only to his vicar, Peter, and his success, uh, successor, um, and states that, that it is the Roman pontiff who is the successor of Peter and the vicar of Christ, right? Vicar of Christ is not a biblical term. Uh, that's another thing to consider. Um, and actually, uh, in... 1 Peter chapter 2, it says that we are of a holy priesthood, 
uh, those that are in the church, right? If you are a Christian, if you are saved, you are of a royal priesthood, a holy priesthood. Um, also, another thing, too, is in Matthew uh, 23, it says uh, that we are not to call any man father, right? But here, the Pope, you know, Pope is Italian for essentially Papa, right? But then another title for the Pope, uh, by as uh, called by uh, Catholics, is the Holy Father, right? There's only one Father in the Bible, and that's God. God is the Father, right? So the fact that the Catholic tradition teaches that we should be calling this man Father is against the Bible, it's anti-Scripture, and as we're going to see, um, continuing through the slides, uh, he's also anti-something else. In discussing who the Pope is, I've decided to bring up some passages about who uh, about uh, him. Here I've decided to take uh, in uh, da from Daniel chapter 9, verse 26. This is prophetically given uh, by Gabriel, uh, the angel, um, who tells uh, Daniel about uh, the restoration of Israel, uh, the atonement for sin, um, the uh, in the reign of the Messiah, right? Um, now here's here's an interesting uh, factor to consider. Um, we'll read verse twenty six and then we'll continue. Um, it says, "And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself." Okay. Well, who is that referring to? Let's continue the rest of the verse. It says, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolate, desolations are determined. Right? So, the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Okay? This is, this is after... Um, as in verse 25, it talks about uh, the Jews returning to their land and rebuilding uh, the, um, the streets of, uh, of uh, Jerusalem, um, as demonstrated with Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. This is in reference to 70 AD, where uh, Roman Emperor Titus had came and sieged uh, the Temple of Jerusalem, right? So what happened before that was that the Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself, right? That's in reference to Jesus Christ being crucified, right? And being rejected by the people of Israel, right? That had to come first, and then after came this, right? So who is the people of the prince that shall come? Well, the, the prince that shall come is the Antichrist, Right? And who is the Antichrist? The Antichrist is Roman. Okay? So in verse 27, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. This is the 70th week. You know, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. Right? In, in reference to Daniel. Okay? Um, and, in the, and who is the he? He's confirming a covenant with them for one week. What is this covenant? Well, it says, and in the midst of the, the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate. Right? Um, so there, we're seeing he betrays the nation of Israel. So this is obviously not somebody who is, who is good. And this is the prince that shall come in reference to what was referenced in uh, verse 26. Right? But uh, even until the consummation, in that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So Jesus warned in Matthew 24, verse 15, it says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso re readeth let him understand, right? The abomination of desolation is the Antichrist, right? That is uh, the prince that shall come. Right, and what is what is he going to be doing in there? Right, this is uh, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, 
right? And whoso readeth, let him understand. So what is he going to do in there? This is in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse uh, 3 to 4. It says, Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, right? So the son of perdition exalts himself above all that is called God, and and he sits in the holy temple, right? This is of the prince that shall come, right? And this at this point he's already came, right? And he's Roman. He's having himself worshipped as God. He's essentially calling himself the Holy Father, the Vicar of Christ. Okay? And as we continue, I'm going to be showing you case and example, case and point, that this, there could not be anybody else that it could be talking about. And the early Christian reformers, whether it being Martin Luther or John Knox or whoever you agree, may agree with or disagree with, they all had one thing in common. They all could agree on who was the Antichrist going to be, and he was going to be Pope, okay? According to the scriptures, right? But remember, when we're talking about this, and we're talking about him setting himself up in the temple, um, having himself worshipped as God, Um, let's just remember in Isaiah 14, verse 12, uh, to 14, where it's talking about Lucifer, it says, how art thou fallen from heaven? O Lucifer, son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground, uh, which didst weaken the nations for thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the North. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. This is Antichrist. This is Satan. To call yourself like the Most High, to call yourself in place of Christ, that is, by definition, Antichrist. And he's going to set himself up in a position where he's going to want to be worshipped like God. This is the Satan, this is Antichrist, and it is clearly demonstrated with what 1.5 billion people in the world calls the Vicar of Christ. In Revelation 6 verse 2, it says, And I saw and behold a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. So here, this is a description of the Antichrist. This is uh, after the first seal is broken, and uh, that's essentially who Jesus uh, releases, right? But here, it it gives an interesting description, um, a white horse. Um, Somebody in particular is usually wearing all white. Um, Another interesting thing, too, is he had a bow. Now, he's going out to conquer going forth uh, conquering and to conquer, right? And he's carrying a bow, but where's his arrows? Um, He's not carrying any arrows according to what the passage says. And then finally, a crown was given unto him. Hmm. He's going into battle, and he's wearing a crown, and he has a bow. And, uh, yeah. Well, um... This is interesting because a bow does not have to mean necessarily a bow and arrow. A bow can be a bent object, right? And as you can see here with uh, Pope uh, John Paul, um, um, Pope Benedict, um, who's uh, known as Cardinal Ratzinger, he was actually a part of the Hitler Youth. Um and there he is wearing, uh, carrying around uh, that same bow, right? Um, there you have uh, Pope Innocent uh, the Eighteenth. Um, there he is, you know, wearing his papal tiara, 
And uh, here's another pope. Uh, he was the last pope to uh, wear uh, the papal tiara. Um, this was uh, in the 60s. Um, but here I'm just going to play a little video for you um, just to show uh, a little bit of information about the papal tiara as this is kind of where our, our conversation you know, has, has started. The Pope is a man of many hats, both literally and figuratively. He is the Bishop of Rome, the Vicar of Christ, successor of St. Peter, and many more titles. One that is often forgotten is that he is the Sovereign of the Vatican and essentially a king. In fact, officially, Vatican City is the only absolute monarchy in Europe. And in fact, for the longest time, the Pope had his own crown called the Papal Tiara. The papal tiara was the crown of various popes and is still featured prominently on many iconographies in the Vatican, including the coat of arms and on the flag. Yet, the pope is never seen wearing the papal tiara anymore. Only the pointy hat called the mitre. Mitres, unlike the papal tiara, are worn by all bishops around the world and signifies their rank as a bishop of a diocese. And as such, any iconography or political cartoon representing the pope in the past would feature the papal tiara instead. There have been many varying designs of the papal tiaras, but the general composition is a large round or slightly pointed helmet with three crowns or rings, often decorated ornately. Each pope typically received their own tiara, though they could wear any of the previous tiaras they wanted to. However, the majority have been lost or destroyed with only the most recent tiaras surviving and being put on display in the Vatican Museum. So what happened to the tiara? It was actually used up until 1965 with the final pope to wear it being St. Pope Paul VI, who was crowned as pope on June 21st of 1963 and last wearing the crown on his entrance of the Second Vatican Council. After Vatican II, he would sell the tiara to the Cathedral of Washington, D.C., where it is displayed to this day, and as far as I'm aware, the only tiara located in the United States and was never used again. Vatican II, to summarize, was the Church's attempt to modernize the institution, and as such, it can be assumed that Pope Paul was retiring the crown as a means to continue modernizing the Church, since the Pope no longer had an extensive kingdom or any real temporal political power, so phasing out monarchical imagery was meant to show the papacy embracing its modern role. And given Pope Francis's preference for a more humble and modest image, it's unlikely he'll return to use the tiara, though perhaps his successor will. What do you guys think? Should the papal tiara make a return or stay in the past? Your holiness. Your sins. I don't have any sins to confess. I'm a contradiction. My God. Okay, to end this off, uh, this is not going to be the last um, the last connections that I'm going to be talking about when it comes to uh, Catholicism and uh, the ultimate uh, Antichrist reign uh, that will be appearing um, before the end times. Um, but uh, let's keep this in mind. Let's keep the Pope in mind. Don't don't let the Pope uh, escape your mem memory as we continue through this presentation. Because, yes, I am saying these things for a reason. 